So, ladies and gentlemen, friends of Yates, members of the Yates Society, you're all extremely welcome here this evening on this glorious 9th of June evening in beautiful sunshine. As I was driving back in here this evening, Ben Bulban never looked better. I mean, it just looked stunning. Um, and so what an appropriate backdrop uh, for an evening to talk about Yates and Sligo. Um, this is the 12th uh, annual Yates Day. It marks uh, WB Yates's birthday, which happens next Tuesday, June the 13th. Um, I believe, I think he's 158, looking well on it. Uh, and um, the cake cutting will actually take place at the building here at one o'clock in the time-honoured fashion. Uh, O'Hare's have always sponsored the cake. Uh, and we'll do that at one o'clock, hopefully, if the sun is still shining outside the building. The cake, of course, is free, as it always has been. And we just think it's a nice way to actually mark the birthday, to share cake with people going by in their cars, on the street and whatever, with their children. Eilie, we're hoping we'll have some of her littley ones with us also on Tuesday. There's no break for Eilie, so she never stops. Um, so um, this, of course, then, is the Nyland Lecture. Honouring the wonderful Nora Nyland, seen here on my left, Nora was a co-founder of the Yates Society and worked very hard at the beginning of the establishment of the Yates Society to you know, make a contribution and to make it work. Because remember, it was so much harder then to, to, to just do things. If you look back at some of the early letters in re relation to running um, the first summer school, you know, everybody had to get a letter typed with the little mistakes carefully corrected and then sent off into, into the ether and hoping that someone would, re would reply and hoping they'd all reply in time. So there was no such thing, of course, as email or anything of that kind. So they worked incredibly hard to start the summer school and to be fair to them, they kept it going and it's the 64th summer school this year. Of course, Nora is best known for her extraordinary valiant efforts to establish a, a beautiful collection of contemporary Irish art from the 20th century, including, of course, the wonderful Jack Yates paintings. Nora was if nothing if ferocious and enthusiastic and absolutely would go anywhere in her little car to beg, borrow, steal, probably more of the first two rather than the last, to ensure that she had the paintings for Sligo. She hailed from Galway, but she took Sligo uh, to her heart and loved her job as the county librarian and if memory serves me correctly, she also established um, the first kind of mobile library going around Sligo and trying to share books with young children who mightn't have been able to get in uh, to the library in town. So she was a, a terrific woman. And of course, she was indeed somebody that Eileen Kilgannon knew. So that makes it a very special evening indeed that we have somebody that knew I, um, Nora personally. And I'm sure that she will tell us about that uh, uh, when she speaks. So what can I say about Eileen then? We've talked about Yates Day and we've talked about the summer school and we've talked about Nora and now it's time to talk about Eileen. Eileen of course hates being talked about, especially in public. She does know her Jemison from her paddy <laughs> and probably quite a number of others as well. She can surely spot a fi fine pint of Guinness from about five miles away. But she does love a decent glass of wine, like it has to be decent. And she's often found in the fine dining places in downtown Bruxelles, or of course the rest of us mere mortals would refer to that as Brussels, but it's, it's Bruxelles if you're Eileen, right? Um, she's a woman also who's been known to place a few bets and go to a few ladylike kind of class of bets on a horse or two or three. Um, and is someone who loves life. And Eileen is one of the few people I know that always arrives wherever she is smiling. And that is a great thing to have. I can't think of Eileen not smiling, unless, of course, she's concentrating. Unless, of course, she's concentrating in her great passion of sharing drama and sharing it with ch small children and older children, students, sharing her love of poetry, sharing her love of Sligo, sharing her love of drama. And being so passionate about it, that's the only time. And you can sometimes see a small frown on her face because, you know, she, she wants the best from those children. And they know that too, and they've always risen to the occasion because they know that Eileen is doing it for them. It's never about Eileen, and it's always about the children. And that's an extraordinarily 
an extraordinary gift to have. It's not about whether Eile feels better about it. It's whether the children have got it and can do their best for their parents, for their loved ones, and also for themselves to take that gift with them through their lives. I've been lucky enough that my own daughter studied with Eile and went on then to study drama as a result of the legacy that Eile left her. And she said that in her first year in drama college, some of the things that they were teaching her, she already knew them because Eile had already taught her. So I think there are many, many young people in Sligo, and some of them are here tonight, they're slightly older, uh, and they were students of Eile's, and they've come back because they know that studying uh, with Eile was something very special indeed. So I couldn't think of anyone else that we could ask, actually, to talk about my Sligo, my Yates. Uh, it's fair to say that Eile was a bit surprised when I asked her. Uh, so I, ha I had to do a little bit of cajoling to persuade her. But I'm delighted that she agreed. And the honour is all ours that she has agreed to come and talk about the thing that she's passionate about. And in case there's any doubt that she's always been passionate, the here's the book that she published in, well, quite a few years ago now, Eileen, 1989, Folk Tales of the Yates Country, complete with a lovely picture of Ben Bulban, just as it is this evening. So she's been toiling at the Yeats, um, at the Yeats uh, concept and the Yeats work for all of her life. So she has many friends, many, many friends, both here and um, abroad, and we are delighted to be able to share uh, this evening with you, Eileen, and that you've agreed, as I said, to talk to us about my Sligo, my Yeats. The floor is yours. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Susan, <laughs> for that great speech about me. <laughs> Welcome to one and all here. Thank you all for coming here. I've got such surprises with the people who've arrived here tonight, former students from long ago. Fantastic. I'm delighted I'm here, and I thank Susan after the cajoling the director of the Eighth Society for giving me the honour of presenting the Noran Island Lecture. I'll talk for about 30 minutes and I think after that, it's, it's a nice sociable evening I think. We could be sociable and have questions, reviews, discussions or whatever for another few minutes after the talk is finished. In order to get me going on my Sligo, my Yeats, I've chosen to begin with the Yeats poem you're not surprised, I think, to match this talk. I've chosen the poem, Red Hanrahan's Song About Ireland. I feel it suits perfectly, because Red Hanrahan was a happy-go-lucky character that Yeats invented to bring his ideas and his interpretation of our mythology to a wider, yet a thinking audience. The old brown thorn trees break in two high over common strand under a bitter black wind that blows from the left hand. Our courage breaks like an old tree in a black wind and dies. But we have hidden in our hearts the flame out of the eyes of Kathleen, the daughter of Hulahan. The wind has bundled up the clouds high over Knocknaray and thrown the thunder on the stones for all that Maeve can say. Angers that are like noisy clouds have set our the beat, but we and kissed the quiet feet of Kathleen, the daughter of Hulahan. Yellow pool has overflowed high up on Cluthna Bear, for the wet winds are blowing out of the clinging air, like heavy flooded waters our bodies and our blood. But purer than a tall candle before the holy rood is Kathleen, the daughter of Hulahan. So we can all identify with Red Hanrahan, and I identify with Sligo, and the Sligo that Yeats inhabited, and that he describes here too, it's Sligo, and it's Yeats' Sligo. And Yeats bowing to Kathleen E. Houlihan is both symbolic and real. It touched his heart. <coughs> Kathleen E. Houlihan, as we know, was the woman that represented Ireland for poets for years when Martin, my only two words of Gaelic tonight, Tír Dra, the love of the native shore, our fatherland, was forbidden by the powers that were to be mentioned in poetry, etc. 
for Yeats, the love of Kathleen was his love for Ireland and his love for his muse, the beautiful Maud Gone, whom he made famous. Maud later played the part of Kathleen in the play he wrote and directed in the National Theatre, which he founded. It's appropriate that the Noran Island lecture should take place here in the Yates building, just as Susan mentioned. She was part of that founding group for the first international summer school. I remember her as she walked into Master's room, Kamas the Burka, in Grange National School. Then, a two-teacher school, of course, being children we called her Miss Nylons, which were stylish and fashionable hosiery, maybe fairly new then. From my desk in the master's room, I saw the nylons. And in those days, ladies like that, or ladies of your mother's age, would have worn high heels of some kind. But I recall this lady, Nora Nyland. She wore the kind of shoes that I only flat shoes that I've never saw, saw afterwards until Princess Diana arrived decades later. Nora was tall, so she didn't need the heels anyway. And just as Susan in indicated, she carried a cardboard box of library books into the school. And that, of course, was the mobile library operated by that woman of action at that time. She brightened up the school day. And well, there's a fine, bright portrait of Nora Nyland by our current Irish portrait artist, Mick O'Dee hanging in the model here in Sligo. So for her lecture this evening, my topic is My Sligo, My Yates. And this room is a good place for me to tell that tale because it holds happy memories for me. In this building, I launched my own school of speech and drama many years ago. Teaching here in this room at times and in other rooms here, the first thing that the children see when they come in now and they all look at the safe and they say, what's in there? They, they see all the images of Yeats, what's in there? So we have to think about that. Somehow the idea of treasure comes to mind. This is where all the money and valuables were kept once upon a time when it was a bank. But now that the room has been transformed into a space dedicated to William Butler Yeats, the life of work of William Butler Yeats, we can decide what is the treasure that Yeats holds within this safe. I love the words treasure from my Yeats. The word is a Greek root, like Thessaurus, and Yeats himself said, only Greece rivaled Ireland in the exuberance and power of its mythology. I love this room. I love having this room as part of my Sligo. There certainly can be no doubt that W.B. Yeats is, through his life's work, a treasure to Sligo and to Ireland, and they are inextricably linked. I have worked my way from childhood, from learning the poems of William Butler Yeats to teaching the poems and plays of W.B. Yeats, now to a few generations of Sligo children. This is a life's work, and not something you can do alone. I needed the guidance and help of many like-minded people, and I call them trailblazers, who know and love the terrain to show the way. I'll take a drink now before I, I um, tell you about my trailblazers. The first trailblazer at the learning stage was, oh, I suppose it's another Irish word, Banny Kelly, Mrs. Kelly in the Grange National School as well as teaching us accurate spoken Irish, she taught us the stories of our surroundings. Connell Gullibon, after whom our mountain was named, the famous lovers Dermot and Gráinne, and Dermot's final end on the mountain at the hands of our hero, Finn McCool. That seemed to be just like the stories that Yeats heard from Mary Battle. And then I began to learn the poetry of W.B. Yeats. My sister Pat and I went to Sligo every Saturday to Maggie Hughes's Sligo School of Elocution. And so Yeats's Fiddler of Dooney was no stranger to us. 
We knew him anyway. Joe Dowd was a lodger in my Auntie Lizzie's house in High Street, the famous father of Shamie and all those famous fiddlers. There too, in Sligo School of Elocution, we acted in Yeats plays like The Land of Heart's Desire and easily moved into the fairy world where the fairy child spirited away the newly married bride just as she spirited away the child in the poem, The Stolen Child. These classes were useful at the time for us as the fit-up theatres made regular visits to Grange to stage popular melodramas of that era. I remember East Lynn. Whenever children were required for the plays, Pat and I were hastily prepared for the stage in Grange Hall with the help of some expertly whisper prompts from their strolling players, Mr. Daniels and Mr. de Gabriel. Every year at Easter time, our enthusiasm for the poetry and the plays was enlivened when Fesh Liggy and Fesh Kjol competitions added spice to our enthusiasm. To their great credit, both of these Fesh awarded two Yeats Cups annually for under 16 and over 16 recitals of Yeats poetry. The prize winner's concert was the highlight of the week in those days. Lady Gore Booth in Fesh Kjol and Mayor of Sligo and Feshligi shaking your hand to give you out the medal or the cup if you were lucky that year. My next trailblazer for WB Yeats was somebody that many of you knew, a formidable woman, Mary Watson, the legendary teacher of speech and drama here. For me, hers was a new and unforgettable interpretation of the work of Yeats. And she brought us up close to Yeats when we presented as a choral group in our school uniforms a Red Hanrahan Song About Ireland and other poems on the stage of the Town Hall at the very first Yeats International Summer School. Mary Watson was at the helm conducting us for that historic occasion and the whole affair was presided over, as I recall, by Frank Wynne, whom I remember later signing the documents for the transfer of this building from the AIB Royal Bank to the Yates Society. She created a tape of 63 poems of Yates with her, the Henry brothers, David Henry and Edmund Henry. And this was one of her favorites. She dedicated it to Anne Gregory. Never shall a young man thrown into despair by those great honey-coloured ramparts at your ear, <clears throat> love you for yourself alone and not your yellow hair. But I can get a hair dye and set such colour there, brown or black or carrot, that young men in despair may love me for myself alone and not my yellow hair. I heard an old religious man but yesternight declare that he had found a text to prove that only God, my dear, could love you for yourself alone and not your yellow hair. <laughs> so going from the poems on to the plays, the great joy and the trailblazer for the plays was Sligo Drama Circle for me and the joy of the amateur drama circuit with Liam McKinney at the helm. And then there was an even greater joy at being part of summer theatre in the town hall as we had no theatre then in Sligo. We had a campaign for a theatre for Sligo. No social media then, so the stickers in the back window of the car. And to gather our war chest of money for our theatre, at 8 p.m. every Tuesday and Thursday night, it was curtained up on Irish authors and Yeats plays for an audience mainly of tourists and some local people. And for some of us, with the hair wet after a quick swim in Ross Point before we went out. All of us amateurs were ready for the stage at eight o'clock. The prestige audiences, of course, were the le professors, lecturers, and students at the Yates International Summer School at the end of July and the beginning of August. The plays were in the creative hands of another trailblazer, who was Walter McDonough. We played not only the traditional plays, we forged forward into Yeats' plays for dancers. Mary McDonough, dancer in At the Hawk's Well, the play that gave our theatre its name. Masks by Kate McDonough and The Only Jealousy of Beamer, and plays which Yeats had conjured up to emulate and use the Japanese no tradition of plays. 
We even staged one of Yeats' later plays called The Words Upon the Window Pane. This is a play where Yeats indulged his love of the occult and the links with the other world. And Joan Fitzpatrick was memorable as she spoke in the voice of Jonathan Swift to perform the part of the medium. <laughs> Walter Macdonough's baton passed on to Niall Henry, the Blue Raincoat Theatre Company at the factory, who even performed the Cuchulain cycle of plays and other Yeats plays on the seashore. W.B. Yeats would be a severe critic, but I think he would have loved to have seen his plays performed in the great outdoors of Sligo. W.B. Yeats went on to create and found a national theatre in Dublin, and that work for many years was his passion. He had many allies, mostly Lady Gregory and John Millington Singh. So that was all the learning time. And now I get on to the teaching. Teaching the poems and plays. How did the words of W.B. Yeats jump off the pages of the book for me, Eileen Kilgannon, that big fat book? And it was such a question, but Yeats had thought of everything. And his words appeal to the reader, the writer, and especially to the speaker of the work. He sought to create speech sounds that were so musical and meaningful that they filled every aspect of ordinary life and every story of love and even of battles. And he turned the poetry into a memorable joy. Yeats had journeyed with the Rhymers Club in London and he was fastidious about the cadence and the rhythm of the poem. My eyes are opened every year when I hand the children and young students this book and say, pick out the poem you like out of that book. So the big fat book it was handed to many of you here. And it's always a surprise because you'll always find a new gem. They choose, you've just found new gems and it's that is where the depth of our Nobel Prize winning poet shows his genius in the deep recesses of our mind in his philosophy of life and all its reality because he used the most beautiful poetic language there was then another trailblazer who came in my teaching she's here tonight that's Anne Carton in her crash had been teaching poetry to three and four year olds for the fesh and when the Yates Day was launched, with a series of fun events, Anne convinced me it would be possible to teach a class full of four-year-olds a Yeats poem, or part of a Yeats poem. And so we managed to stage, first in the garden of the county library, groups of more than 30 little ones to perform a verse of a Yeats poem. The favourite one was The Fiddler of Dooney and I Am of Ireland. And one famous year, a couple of years ago, really bright four-year-olds did the whole of the Fiddler of Dooney. Next week we'll be doing a verse. <laughs> <laughs> so now to go back to the ancestors. The ancestors of Yeats. We are lucky in Sligo that W.B. Yeats' ancestors, the families from which he came, settled in Sligo a few centuries ago. The Middletons and the Bollocksons. They were, by the time William and his siblings were born, business people in milling and shipping. And the Yeats side of the family from the northeast of Ireland found their way to Ireland through the church. These families ensured that William and his siblings had a stable, happy home when they were here in Sligo, and when they lived here, and during all their summer holidays. My ancestors. Um, we have the mountain here anyway to show me. My origins are all from County Sligo. On my mother's side, from the parish of Ahamlish, the Grange area, the Gilmartins, the Pat Dans from Gortnalek, the Ladens from Culchy Care, Ben Bulban is the backdrop there. On my father's side, the Kilgannons. Our Kilgannons are from the Drumore West area, Gleniski, Donaula, and the Harns from Mass Hill, Clunacool, on either side of the Ox Mountains. So I have mountains on two sides of me. And that brings me to why and when uh, I wrote this book. 
which is folk tales of the eighth country. Um, my working life took me into industry, as Susan has already allowed, <laughs> alluded to. Guinness tasting as part of the work in Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> Whiskey tasting as part of the work in Irish distillers. Powerful life. And people say, and they pay you to do that. <laughs> Well, as usual, on social occasions, I might recite a Yeats poem. And at one of those events on the Shannon a long time ago, as Susan mentioned, a year, because there's a year on it, I think, um, uh, the, captain, uh, the captain, Sean Feehan, uh, he was the man who owned the Mercier Press, Press, which is still in existence, approached me to write a book on local history. I was a very busy bee then, but, and I'm still a busy bee. But I agreed, and as the deadlines approached, the captain told me. All I needed to complete the book was the glue. I said, mm, okay. The glue was to stick my bottom to the chair. <laughs> and so there were a lot of <laughs> sleepless nights before the launch of the book, <laughs> entitled Folk Tales of the Eighth Country. And that's how it first appeared with Ben Bulban on the cover. Um, well, I had a little problem about del another delay, which had nothing to do with the glue, actually. Uh, I had a few extracts from the poetry of W.B. Yeats at, for the stories, and for me, they were an integral part of each story. And at that time, it was necessary to gain the rights from the owner of the copyright, and so I wrote to Michael Yeats, son of W.B., who at that time was a very busy man, working mainly in Europe, but he was based in Dublin, and much time elapsed as I waited for the release of the copyright. Again, good fortune in this very room. I met Michael Yates at a Yates summer school to follow up on my request for copyright. And true to being a man of few words at the time, copyright was issued soon afterwards. And the book was launched in, well, thanks to my employers, I suppose, the old whiskey corner at the Jemison Distillery in Dublin. <laughs> by B.B. Baskin at the time, and in Kyohan's bookshop in Castle Street, Sligo, and the Four Masters bookshop in Donegal. A few years later, as the Mercier Press were tackling into the American market with these kind of books, it was the same book again, but they said this is a sort of the shape that it should take now, and it was called Myths and Magic of the Yeats Country the second time round. I was supposed to get going on a lot of other books after that, but I never got around to it. I never got the clue. <laughs> so I'm going through Teddy Kilgannon's book, just to keep it all in the family then. Teddy Kilgannon's book, A Sligo and its Surroundings, the history of, of this area. I got a real thrill when I was by found a coincidence there. I saw that Teddy had received the kind permission of Senator W. B. Yeats to reprint in full The Fiddler of Dooney in his section on Dooney Rock. So that gives me a, an excuse now to stop talking like this and talk like poetry. And The Fiddler of Dooney is a well-known uh, poem around here. I'd say most of you know it. When I play on my fiddle in Dooney, folk dance like a wave of the sea. My cousin is priest in Kilvarnet, my brother in Maharabwi. I passed my brother and cousin. They read in their books of prayer. I read in my book of songs that I bought at the Sligo Fair. When we come at the end of time to Peter sitting in state, he will smile on the three old spirits, but call me first through the gate. For the good are always the merry, save by an evil chance. And the merry love the fiddle, and the merry love to dance. And when the folk there spy me, they will all come up to me with, here is the fiddler of Dooney, and dance like a wave of the sea. <laughs> now, we're going to go back to the treasure. That is W.B. Yeats and his legacy. The pull and magic of Sligo drew him and I want you to find what this treasure is or how we could sum it up. 
He named a play, The Land of Heart's Desire for Sligo, and he tells of the power of that magnetic pull in the most famous poem, The Lake Isle of Inishfree. He could hear the waters of Loch Gill as he was in standing in London lonely, as he said himself, in the deep heart's core. Here now we can remember one of the most important Irish men of our time from a cultural, literary, poetic, politi political and artistic point of view. I consider him to be one of the most important Irish people of all time. This is a very strong statement, I know. But taking his legacy in poetry, plays, stories, foundation of the National Theatre, senator in the first ever Irish government, influencer of writers and scholars, and being quoted by presidents of America, ex-presidents of America, and all sorts of politicians and strange people around the world today and being first ever Irish winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature, we can begin to appreciate the value of Yeats as a treasure. The changes in his political mindset and how that affected his poetry and his life and his lifestyle show his endurance, always trusting his own very individual instinct. With his sharp intellect, his diligence, in writing and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting his poetry and plays, he could be a role model in many ways for all of us, especially for our young people. He pointed the way forward for us too in his reflection on the cycles of history. They're all shown around the room here. The gyres, we have the representation of the gyres here, the inevitability of change. At the back, the astrological study, and it's all on the wall there. And at the root of it all, our ancient mythology, folklore and stories handed down generation to generation. He was the first ever Nobel Prize in Literature to be awarded to an Irish person. Could he have achieved that glorious accolade for his work in poetry and drama if he had not discovered from the very beginning the folklore and mythology of every step of his way around Sligo? Well, we can think about that one, maybe so. But that with his own artistic training and temperament and the beauty of this countryside combined to kickstart a life which produced poetry and plays which appealed internationally and to many cultures. Sligo, with its myths and legends, its ancient, ancient archeology span and its monuments and his mountains drew him back when the family lived in London and Dublin for economic reasons. Remember, in 1915, Yeats refused a knighthood. So, we take it that WB did not want to be Sir William. In his most political poem, Easter 1916, when William Butler Yeats reflected on his visits to Sidel when carefree, we recall the beautiful poem in memory of Eva Gorbuth and Con Markievicz. The light of evening, Lissadell, great windows open to the south, two girls in silk kimonos, both beautiful, one a gazelle. But now he finds Constance Gorbuth Markievicz reprieved from execution as a leader of the rising. And he posed a kind of rhetorical question in the poem. For England may keep faith for all that is done and said. His muse, Maud Gonne, too, was motivated by that call to arms, and the final iconic stanza of the poem is the one most often quoted from Easter 1916. I write it out in a verse. Macdonough and Macbride, and Connolly and Pierce, now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, are changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. So when he won the Nobel Prize 100 years ago now, he won it, the citation for it was, for his always inspired poetry, which in a highly artistic form gives expression to the spirit of a whole nation. His answer, part of his answer, because there are lots of 
things that happened in Stockholm at that stage. I consider that this honour has come to me less as an individual than as a representative of Irish literature. It is part of Europe's welcome to the free state. So to conclude, I turn to Yeats' own poetry, of course, and one of his last poems was under Ben Bulbin. First he gave advice to sculptors and painters, and then he gave severe advice to the poets, what they had to do. I won't finish on that note because it's his tough, fastidious way of doing things. Irish poets, learn your trade. Sing whatever is well made. Scorn the sort now growing up all out of shape from toe to top. Their unremembering hearts and heads, base-born products of base beds. Sing the peasantry and then hard-riding country gentlemen. The holiness of monks and after porter drinkers randy laughter. Sing the lords and ladies gay that were beaten into the clay through seven heroic centuries. Cast your mind on other days that we in coming days may be still the indomitable Irishry. There are always two sides to Yeats's work though and he has some happy fun things. We have the fiddler of Dooney and he tries to find time for fun and dancing too. So I prefer to end, this is about my Sligo, your Sligo, our Sligo, our Yeats. So he doesn't say Sligo this time but he says Ireland. I am of Ireland and the holy land of Ireland. Time runs on, cried she. Come out of charity, come dance with me in Ireland. So, come dance with me in Ireland. They say questions, but I don't know if there's questions. Um, um, any, so many people here I know, so many voices I know. I can hear your own voices here, a lot of you. Welcoming two students of long ago from London, Javon and Marie, <laughs> and lots of other people from everywhere. Um, so let's have a bit of chat because then we can have another glass of wine maybe or something like that. <laughs> oh, you could, I do, uh, yeah, but not you because you have your legs, are, your legs won't take. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Oh, red this time. Yeah, I love red. <laughs> Pardon? A cabernet sauvignon, madam. <laughs> okay, so. No, 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 no complaints. So obviously people want to join in and offer thoughts about their own experience. Thanks very much. Slancha, Slancha. Uh, Martin. Yes, Martin. Gurum Yes. I loved how you started with Maud Gahn. And she did say, and by the way, she died on the 27th of April 1953, 70 years ago this year. Yeah. And uh, she did say that at one point, Red Hand and Sound Bar was her favorite poem. Which one? Red Hand and Sound Bar. Red Hand, yeah. And that, you know, that's really the Aces Ashley for her. Yes, it is.
and she walked in with the big box of books, the same as you described, <laughs> and, um, and we proceeded to, she proceeded to smoke. <laughs> <laughs> are heavy. Uh, very heavy, yeah. And, uh, and even to get funding for those books. I mean, as a librarian and as somebody, she, she just was innovative and, and, and uh, tremendous. And very soon afterwards, of course, the van was bought and the books came in the van. But no, we did the same thing. Yeah, yeah, she did. Yeah. It's probably worth thinking about the, another trailblazer, a uh, Yates trailblazer was his mother. Susan Pollockson, who of course was from Sligo, but she was a trailblazer in a very unusual way because she was the one who brought the stories to life, the old, the ancient stories. She would tell the children the stories when they were not here. So in Dublin and, and in London, because she was terribly homesick, she would repeat those stories. She wasn't very well educated in that traditional sense. She was a woman in a large family and wouldn't have been overly educated, but she listened to the stories. And the great treasure she passed to her son was her love of those stories, largely because she was homesick. Yeah. And then he, he took them on. And in fact, his, his, his first collection is largely based on the stories that his mother told him. And she just gets written out of all the stories. Her name was Susan Pollockson, uh, largely because she then sort of became ill and, and, and had, had a stroke. And she lived her last years quietly up on the top of the house in London and was sort of forgotten and not at all as flamboyant and as uh, outrageous as, as her husband, WB's father, John. But actually, she, her treasure, she passed all of her treasure about Sligo and those ancient stories to her son. Who knows, if she had been not interested at all in any of that, they might never have any of them actually just drawn from that great yes. well. So I think it's, it's worth, um, particularly as your own book is, is also yeah. from that sort. I'm very conscious of the fact that I left out loads of things and loads of people when I talked, because Joyce will know especially uh, that, you know, there were four in the family. William was the eldest um, and Jack was an artist, the youngest, and the two ladies, of course, the two women, written out again. Lily and Lolly were such a huge factor in something I'd love to talk about. It's like, is, yeah, it's the businessman. He had to sell the stuff. When he wrote this stuff, it was hard to sell poetry, I think. And I know the Mercier Press told me books of poetry didn't sell years ago. So uh, Lily and Lolly, who, were, who went to London, Lily went to London, learned printing in London, and then set up that cooler press. That's a whole other part of their transmission of the stories. Making things that were beautiful yeah. was their mission. Yeah. yeah. They certainly didn't earn a very <coughs> huge amount of money, but they loved no. what they did. Yeah. And if you have a few things to say, because I left out a few things, but not to worry. Yes. Uh, I would like to say Thank you coming from coming from Limerick to tonight. Your, your words were enchanting and the sound of your voice going with the words. Tell us. Tell us. I mean, it was. I mean, from the, the, the from, from the Gothic building, 
that was used as a storeroom for every letter, every document, every piece of paper. And then the night before, the day before, the builders moved in to get rid of that thing, we had to sort through what was in it. I mean, there was a card from, from Beckett and various Imagine. things, but there was no order on it because we didn't have anybody to do it. And once Georgie, who was secretary at that time, when she put things in, they were there, and then there was an Xbox piled on top of it. And it was an absolute <coughs> nightmare to get it emptied. Because we had literally tons of paper in it. And we did. We piled it in the centre of the floor here. And, uh, and we all sat around sorting through it. And the big terror was that they may not have everything. Luckily when Stella came she got order on this and things in and I was so happy to find that the value of these were, were actually there because I could never guarantee that we hadn't done irreparable damage. But we hadn't. Well, but just well, God, yes, even the envelopes were still there. <coughs> but it did contain treasure. Yeah. 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 Now, does anybody else want to put in their top and safe me worth? Because I put in a good few top and safe me's worth, and I want to hear yours. <laughs> I'm dying to hear from people to say wee things, just to say any little wee things to so that you can have a glass, because I'm having a glass. Do you know what we'll do? We'll, we'll, uh, we'll allow you to stop, as in stop formally, and then you can chat among yourselves. And, uh, yeah, thank you very much, and thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you very much. So, Eileen, thank you so much. Um, as Sheila rightly said, uh, I think it was Sheila, that you know, the words, the sound, the music in your voice, the love of Sligo, the love of Yates, you really did bring that out and bring it across and shared it so beautifully uh, for all of us and certainly it's it's something I'm very glad I was here uh, to listen to. We have recorded it so it will be online as soon as the guys bring it back to me uh, we'll put it up on our on our website. Um, I would like also to take this opportunity to thank Pat uh, who has always you know helped with the little ones and stood together with Eile and, uh, and helped and loved and cherished them in the same way. So let's have a round of applause. So as I say, all I can say now is it is the Nobel Centenary Year. We will be launching the programme for the centenary events. We're the lead organisation for the centenary celebrations. Uh, we'll be launching them uh, on June the 29th with Minister Catherine Martin uh, and that's going to be uh, mostly in the last quarter of the year because he actually got the announcement on November 14th and the actual prize presented on Alfred Nobel's birthday every year is December 10th uh, so um, that happens regardless of what day of the week it is they always have it on his birthday uh, and of course the funding for the Nobel Prize came from his discovery of dynamite uh, and as many people know, that was his way of kind of going, mm, I didn't quite mean that to be that thing that I invented. I better do something about that. So he invested all his money and they've continued to invest it. So the value of the prize changes from year to year, depending on the investment. Not by much. And so when Yates won it, he won seven and a half thousand pounds. In modern terms, that's around between 900,000 and one million uh, euro. So, you know, it's a substantial prize, but of course, as Eileen rightly pointed out, he always gave credit and said that the prize was as much our, uh, recognition of Europe for the new state, because the free state was established, as you all know, in 1922, and the prize awarded one year later. So we're very excited to be the lead, the lead uh, agency for that, and it is, of course, also the last part of the official decade of centenaries. And it's lovely to be able to end, not on war or death, but on culture, and we'll be hosting an event here in Sligo at the end of November about the next 100 years of poetry and what that might bring. 
Um, so we look forward to that very much. Remember, again tomorrow in the morning, Tamlin McHugh is here to talk about um, holy wells and sacred waters. Um, poetry with the little ones here in the afternoon and a Hazelwood walk with the Hazelwood Heritage Group led by Beatrice, whom many of you know, uh, at three o'clock at Hazelwood. Um, so again, my great thanks to Eileen. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, Eileen, and thank you so much. Would you just step up for me here a minute? Oh, how beautiful. Oh, my goodness me. Thank you so much, Susan. Oh, my goodness.